Welcome. The Office of Special Services Social Emotional and Behavioral Wellness Team is here to speak to you today about stress, resiliency, and being anti-fragile. Please feel free, feel free to reach out to Team OSS. We are here to support you on your social, emotional, and behavioral journey. Key takeaways from today's presentation include identifying kinds of stress and how to recognize it. Participants will identify different, different types of stress and how to tell the difference between good stress and bad stress. What does it mean to be resilient and why is it important? Participants will view the five pillars of resiliency and learn how to incorporate them into their life. What is anti-fragility and how do we develop it? Participants will understand the impacts to our B. Wayne Well dimensions and applying anti-fragility day to day. Next, we will watch a video that reviews the concepts of Nassim Tlaib's book, Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain From Disorder. All right, let's talk about anti-fragility written by Nisam Talib. So when you think of something that is anti-fragile, what do you think of? Well, let's start by diagnosing something that is fragile. You take a box and you kick it a couple times. If there's something fragile in it, it's going to break. It's going to weaken. It's going to get worse. However, if you take a box, something like steel, and there's steel in the box and you kick it around, it's probably not going to weaken. So something that breaks is fragile, something that remains the same is called robust, and something that is anti-fragile actually gets better the more it gets kicked around. So we're going to look into muscles. When you go to the weight room and you lift, do you know what you're actually doing? The muscle fibers in your arm or chest or legs actually break. These muscle fibers break, and whenever you go to sleep that night, they will overcompensate for the pain they felt, and they will build back stronger. And this is just like a lot of vaccinations, to where vaccinations are a small dose of the disease so that your body can build an immunity to it. And you can look up words like mithridization or hormone which basically means becoming immune to a poison by giving yourself a little bit of a poison at a time until you build up an immunity. And this is basically what anti-fragility means. It means becoming better through your struggles. The author says that us as humans should always crave disorder. Being anti-fragile means being alive. If you take a porcelain cup and you throw it on the ground, it's pretty fragile and it's going to break. However, if you take a human and make them do push-ups until they can't do them anymore, they're going to get stronger. As long as they get enough recovery time, there are two things that can break an anti-fragile structure, and that is far too much stressors or not enough recovery time. Imagine a banker. The banker makes around $50,000 a year, and he always knows that his paycheck is going to come on this Thursday. But what is he relying on? He's relying on his job. Now imagine a taxi driver. He makes around $50,000 a year, too. However, he does not always get a paycheck by a reliable source. One day, he might make $150. Another day, he might only make $20. However, his job is very adaptable. So if we look at the banker, the banker is pretty fragile because if the banks start to collapse, he will lose his job. However, the taxi driver is very anti-fragile. He's very adaptable to his situations and he will always find a way to make enough money and that is because he craves chaos he craves disorder you have to fail to get to success let's say that there is no randomness in your life you wake up you go to work for eight hours you come home you do the same thing every night you watch tv for a couple hours and then you go to bed you know what this is called this is called a rut you are living in a rut there is no randomness and your body will eventually start to break down there is no mind or body growth if you start seeing this in your life, if there are no stressors, you should beware. You should try to make something in your life that is a little stressful. That way you can grow from it. Take, for example, the criticism of this channel. This channel grows from all the criticism that I receive. I learn how to make it better. I learn what to improve and how to improve it. Let's take another example. If you tell someone, this is a secret, don't tell anyone. This is a big secret. What's going to happen? It's going to get told even more often because it's anti-fragile. It's going to grow even more. Or what about banned books? Everyone in my school wanted to read the books that were banned, the books that were not allowed. Even the people that didn't want to read books, they wanted to figure out what these books were about. So I'm going to go back to my main point and say that you should try to make your life as anti-fragile as possible. How can you learn to grow from the situations that most people would frown upon, that are stressful? How can you make yourself a better person? Take every situation that happens today and over the next month, try to look for the bright side. Try to look for the side that can make you a stronger version of yourself. I really enjoyed reading this book and the author So let's dive right into it. I would like you to take a few moments to read the current slide and determine which of these would you say are considered stress? Now that you had a time to choose, let's see the answer. Surprise, they all are. Anything can become a source of stress. For example, fear, such as doing this public video, uncertainty and lack of control of your beliefs and attitudes or expectations. 
So now let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. All stress is not created equally. They key, the key difference between the negative and the positive sides of stress is how you perceive the stress situation. Although stress is normal and can't be completely avoided, the trick is to be able to regulate, monitor, and completely harness stress so that you are able to benefit from it rather than suffer from it. As we move from thinking about stress to resilience, which are certainly interrelated, we typically think about the word resilience as a way to grow um, from and respond to stress. Well, resilience in action is far more complex and multifaceted than that definition. When we embody resilience, we demonstrate these five pillars. We demonstrate self-awareness, the awareness of ourselves and our strengths and how we best learn from a challenge. We demonstrate mindfulness, so when we are aware of our feeling in that moment of facing the challenge. We remind ourselves of our purpose. So resilient people are reminded that, gosh, when I face this challenge on my journey toward my purpose, toward my why, um, I will maintain a, I will learn from this attitude and mindset. Resilient people lean into their relationships and they don't go at it alone. Um, they lean into those who will offer insight and advice and perhaps uh, shed light on a new perspective or lens um, that they might not have otherwise considered. And the last pillar of resilience, um, which was new to me, is this idea of self-care. And it makes total sense because when we pour into ourselves, our emotional and mental state is tended to. And that it is what gives us the greatest chance of successfully facing a challenge because we have the mental capacity to face the, ish the issue, we problem solve with more clarity, and we have the resolve to learn from the situation. Self-care is key to resilience. Why is resilience so important? Because resilience results in re living a richer, more satisfying and healthier life. Physical, re physically resilient people work out the kinks and make physical activity a priority. You're less likely to partake in physical and risky behaviors such as drug and alcohol use. Mentally resilient folks seek to be challenged. Emotional resilience allows us to find the positive things in situations even when they seem bleak. And you'll thrive socially because resilient people stay engaged. High quality relationships are also critical to resilience. According to business and psychology professor, Dr. Jane Dutton, there are four distinct pathways for building high quality connections at work. The first being respectfully engaging others. Second is facilitate another person's success with guidance, recognition, and support. Third, build trust. Finally, have moments of play. Too often, we take the world far too seriously. Like playwright Euripides once said, how can you think yourself a great man when the first accident that comes along can wipe you completely out? There's so much truth to the notion that we must learn from our negative experiences. We don't wanna just bounce back though. We wanna be able to withstand them. We've begun this, to discuss two different terms in this presentation, resilience and anti-fragility. Let's take a closer look at what they mean and why it's important for us to be anti-fragile. When we think of a standard definition of resilience, it encompasses the art of bouncing back after experiencing a certain setback. One could assert that this means that we end up at the place we were before the setback occurred. A more updated and impactful definition of resilience centers around the growth that we experience from encountering challenges. We end up in a better place than before the setback occurred. To experience resilience with this growth mindset, we do need to be willing and able to ask for help. If we move one more step above what our new definition of resilience is, we then become anti-fragile. Being anti-fragile isn't just bouncing back and growing from challenges. Being anti-fragile means that we are more able to withstand adverse situations that come our way. In an anti-fragile paradigm, challenges aren't ever setbacks, but become opportunities only meant for growth. In his book, Anti-Fragile, Taleb explains that there is no word that is the exact opposite of fragile, thus the creation of the concept anti-fragility. It is beyond being resilient or being robust. The anti-fragile only 
get better. So some key understandings into developing anti-fragility. Unpredictable things have significant impacts on us and they're going to happen. We have to be able to withstand those things and endure the storm. Building redundancy and rules into systems are important um, because we don't want to have single points of failure. Play it safe in some areas, but take risks in others. We've got to be able to push what we're willing and able to do because that's how we grow. And we talk about that and call that the barbell strategy. There's more on that in our resources in the workbook. We do benefit from chaos. When there is chaos, our normal routines are disrupted and we're able to adapt and adjust to new routines and new things. We have to be able to seek criticism and take on challenges. If we don't have any competition, we're not going to have to work to be the best or to get better. And the skills we have, they may start going away. We have to take a holistic approach and we have to take care of ourselves and be weighing well. So these next few slides, we're going to talk about three different types of anti-fragility, physical, emotional, and mental. Physical anti-fragility depends on taking care of your body. So things such as exercise, sleep, nutrition, hydration, all factor into your physical anti-fragility. When you exercise or lift weights or lift heavy weights, it even it exerts stress on your body. Your muscle fibers break down, but they actually grow back much stronger. This process is the body's response to overcompensate to the trauma and stress and come out stronger than before. This process of overreaction to stress and harm is how mother nature operates. It is the process of life itself. The human body is anti-fragile. On the flip side, if you remove stress from a system, then that system will grow weak. If you were to stay in bed for three weeks instead of lifting weights or exercising, your muscles and bones, in absence of stress, would become weak and wither away. So an anti-fragile body doesn't just strive on stress, but it needs the stress in order to flourish. Emotional anti-fragility. Cultivating an internal foundation of worthiness and integrity, as well as an external network of meaningful connections and relationships in your life beyond your work. These emotional support systems are what sustain you when faced with adversity. So it's important for the human body to have a good balance between internal supports as well as external supports. Not too much of one, not too little of the other, so that when you are faced in times of adversity, your body is able to sustain and overcome that situation. And mental anti-fragility. Mental anti-fragility requires shifting from risk management, forecasting and fear, and promotes developing self-awareness, improving the ability to accept circumstances for what they are, and knowing how to take calculated actions. So consider a stressor like an insult. One can be resilient to insults by merely just ignoring them, or one can use them to your advantage. This can look like using the insult as fuel or motivation to accomplish a task or reach a goal. So let's apply all of this learning about anti-fragility. Look at this activity. What is written on your box? Are there specific areas in your life where you feel rather fragile? In this area, is this area super fragile, fragile, robust, resilient, or anti-fragile? Next, how can you practice with little things today to get stronger to move along the day-to-day -day of being anti-fragile? We hope that you are able to take away some new knowledge from today's events. We have listed many resources here for your continued engagement. And again, please reach out if there is anything Team OSS can do for your social, emotional, and behavioral wellness journey. Have a wonderful day and be Wayne well.